will start from when I was three or four. And uh, my parents live with my grandparents. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're fine. You just carry on. Right, okay. yeah. um, my parents live with my grandparents and they, uh, my parents, to get away from the uh, constrictions of home, used to cycle uh, in the summer from Heathrow or Hounslow to Littlehampton and back. So from a very young age, I was used to being on the road for a very long time. So how, um, long, how long roughly for those listeners that are abroad or not familiar with that? Oh, I see. Uh, well, the distance is about 60 miles. Oh, wow. And, and they used to um, camp uh, about a dial post, which is just by the South Downs. So they would cycle 40 miles, 45 miles, camp, then go to the beach and then come home. And we did that virtually every, every weekend. And for fun, uh, I used to run along sand dunes at the age of five or six, just because I enjoyed it, not realizing this was brilliant training. <laughs> um, and then uh, I went to a, a school where we had a very good PE master and I was in a class where we had the national 100 yard, well, 100 yards in those days, uh, champion, and the county 440 yard champion, 880 yard champion, discus throw and javelin throw, all in the same class. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I was sort of the old one out, really. Um, the only thing I could do, I knew the further I went, the more I could win. Uh, I then joined all oh, back in, let's see, but it must have been 77, 70, no, sorry, I'm talking about uh, 57, 58. Um, I joined Thames Valley Harriers and uh, uh, as, a, as a sort of 13, 14 year old. And I, I was quite good. I got into the, into the Valley team, but I was always fourth or fifth. Uh, and they trained at a track called Alperton and at Alperton they had some people who were race walking and we also did race walking at school and I worked out that I could either do the 440 yards a quarter mile and the half mile when I thought well, I can come second in the half mile or the half mile and the half mile walk so I went in for the walk and won it <laughs> from a chap called Jim Alders. <laughs> you, it's amazing how you always remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> yes and then um uh, uh, with, with the valley training at Alperton, uh, there was also these race walkers, and uh, I decided that I'd have a go. Um, and they were coached by this uh, this chap Harold Whitlock, who'd won the Olympic gold medal in Berlin, wow. and his name still as a seeger uh, uh, on the in the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, still there. Uh, and he was coaching uh, a chap called Don Thompson who uh, had won the London to Brighton eight years. Well, when he finished, he'd won it eight years and was an Olympic gold medalist. So for um, an 18 year old, 17, 18 year old to train with someone who won an Olympic medal uh, was quite something. And I discovered that I was quite good at, at race walking. And so that's how it all began. And then of course we have to ask, it, it doesn't just stop there. You talk about, you're touching on the Olympics there, but you yourself went to the Olympics. Yes, that was in 1968. Um, well, what happened was when I left school in 62, so I was um, junior one mile uh, national champion and uh, record holder. So I, I, I became record holder for the county, the Southern counties and national uh, in 62. Um, at the same time, I was uh, I was not only a sprinter, but I also trained with Don, um, Don Thompson, that is. And um, um, we used to do sort of every, well, for me, every other week, 20 miles. So Don used to go out and do 10 miles in the morning. When we joined, joined him, that's, uh, as we had a group, Martin Higgins, who was, uh, came third in the national championships, Jim Richards, myself, Arthur Thompson, uh, he's still walking at the age of 80. Wow. Uh, and we used to do 20 miles from Heath, um, from Henley's Corner near Heathrow to Windsor Castle and back. 
oh, and that wow. gave me the, and that gave me the background uh, for long distance. Um, I went to college, St David's College, Lampeter in Wales, and uh, it was very difficult to keep training there because it was mainly a sort of rugby fo focus. Uh, and when I got my degree, my coach, um, well, uh, and the chap I'd helped in the London Brighton, Tom Misson. Now he was uh, as good as Don Thompson. Um, uh, Tom was in the Olympics in 1960, but because of a foot injury, he only finished sixth. Um, but he came to me and my parents in 66, I think it must have been, and said that if I put my mind to it, I could become an international. So uh, I thought, well, <laughs> we'll have a go. And he took me under his wing. I mean, I actually stayed with him uh, for a couple of um, uh, summers. And uh, he really gave me the background uh, of building on all the other things that I had done uh, to become uh, a fairly good athlete. <laughs> uh, as a result, um, I won a number of um, uh, prestigious events. Um, uh, let's think. Uh, there would be uh, the national ten miles. Well, I came second in the national ten miles behind uh, Ron Warwick. Um, and then uh, Tom said to me, "Either you could do the twenty kilometers. There are two Olympic events: twenty kilometers and fifty kilometers. Now it's quite possible for somebody to come from nowhere and do twenty kilometers, but for fifty kilometers, you've got to do a lot of training." And he thought that with my background, the 50 kilometers would be the thing to go for. Okay. So we, we trained, um, oh, excuse me. My nose is running. <laughs> we we, we trained. February, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we trained, um, uh, well, I, I trained pretty hard for the winter and uh, I, uh, let's think. In '67, I won the national 50 kilometers championship wow. um, by about six minutes. Uh, what happened? We were, there was a whole bunch of us at uh, 20, 25 kilometers, and I thought this is jolly slow. <laughs> so I, I just gave it, gave it all, all I had, and uh, I, I managed to um, uh, beat the field. And uh, uh, but that might have been a one-off, and I then did the Hastings to Brighton because we had this chap Don Thompson was still pretty good, and uh, uh, we together we were together for the first 13, 14 miles, a place called Windmill Hill, and I managed to get about thirty seconds up, and from eighteen miles to thirty-eight miles, I couldn't get away. But he couldn't catch me, <laughs> so oh, we the same distance apart, <laughs> and that was that sort of laid down the marker. And then I went to East Germany uh, for the World Championship. Um, I I did a very silly race. I tried to burn off the the world record hold. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> Why? What uh, happened? You have to share. Um, oh, I, I had a, um, a very good, um, we went through halfway in two minutes, uh, two, two hours, two minutes, which was something like uh, five minutes up on the world record at that point. <laughs> and uh, I uh, uh, had a bit of a bad patch after that and lost about seven or eight places. And Christoph Hohner, who was with me, uh, uh, also slowed down a bit, but he still won. <laughs> Uh, and that really led on to the other uh, th uh, other bits and pieces. Do you want me to carry on? Yes, this is exciting. <laughs> okay. yes. well, um, so that that laid down a marker for the next year, and um, I had um, again I was aiming for the fifty kilometres, and um, the first three uh, would qualify for the Olympic Games. And uh, there was Paul Nyhill, Brian Ely, myself, Ray Middleton, Don Thompson, all in a group. And eventually um, uh, the group broke up. And um, 
I managed to finish third. Uh, Paul won, uh, Brian was second, I was third. And there was a big gap after that by about four or five minutes. So I got a letter from uh, Prince Philip to say, could I go to the Olympic Games? And what have you I, got to share? So you get that letter, I hope yeah. you get a envelope yeah. with a gold stamp, you know, your letters in gold on the envelope. That's all that's the thing, yes. <laughs> I've still got it somewhere. <laughs> and yeah, um, I'd love to have a photo of it to see and, you know, share. Oh, I, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to look it out. So if you give me your address, I'll... Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll out after the podcast. I've got no idea where it is at the That's moment. a little project for you during this COVID lockdown to find out letter. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just go through the emotions of you've, you, you came third, you realised then, oh, wow. Well, I, it wasn't, wasn't a sure foregone... Up wasn't a foregone conclusion because they might they might not send three but up until the mexico olympics we'd always won a medal so i think the british athletic board thought we'll send three walkers well, well six walkers three for the 20 and three for the 50. and so, obviously you was the one of the ones of the 50 and then yeah. the letter comes from um, prince philip to say you are off to mexico what was yeah that feeling inside that you were trying to represent your country? Um, well, uh, it, 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 there's two sort of uh, feelings. One is great delight, and the other is, oh my God, what, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> uh, because, um, um, I mean, you're sitting, you're, you're, when you're waiting for the race, you're sitting, you've got the world record hold on one side and the um, world champion the other side and all these sort of people. I mean, you never meet anyone who is not um, a national champion or in the first three in their country. I but, mean, there are no other people apart from the officials. <laughs> so before, yeah, before we go on to the actual Olympics itself, because we definitely have to talk about that. Yeah. The build up, you know, to to the, you know, the event. What, what, mm. What's involved with the training? So is it like running where you'll do a tempo run, a hill, you know, a hill walk, sorry, you know? It, it, um, it's very sim uh, similar. Well, you've got to realise, of course, that training techniques between 68 and today have changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, we, we were really learning things quite quickly. And of course, Mexico is, uh, what is it, 7,000 feet up. So um, uh, my coach suggested I trained using a gas mask because that would, <laughs> that would reduce the air pressure. Well, I tried it once or twice, it wasn't very good. Um, what your neighbours think at the time? Like, oh no, <laughs> you're like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know, really. <laughs> um, and then, um, the board sent me out to St. Moritz in Switzerland because that's only half the height of Mexico, but it, it, it was fairly, fairly useful. I mean, I would love, I think I ought really to have been sent to Mexico because we had press um, uh, articles saying that uh, people would die. You know, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna die because of this. Um, so, you know, it was a bit sort of concerning. What, um, because of the altitude? Because of the altitude, yes. And, uh, uh, oh, the, the other, well, the, the training, as you say, is very similar to what you might do for a sort of marathon, uh, middle distance uh, running. So you would do, um, I used to do sort of 50 kilometer training sessions. You know, it's a, it's a marathon a week, really, or uh, one, possibly two. So, you know, on, on Saturday, if there, were, if there were no races, I'd do 20 miles on Saturday and 50 kilometres on Sunday. But what, what, uh, what did you do during the week? Did you carry on? Did you have a day job or studying? Or oh, yeah, I was a school 100%. teacher. 100%. So you were a school teacher during the week and then yeah. in the evenings and weekends training to represent your country at the Olympics? That's, that's it. I, I taught PE, so the class has got my uh, stretching exercises. <laughs> how, how do you feel, you know, in times, later times like now, that, yeah. you know, these athletes are 100% focused on the oh, Olympics? Yeah. There's no job, there's no study, it's all 
Olympics. I could be wrong there. They might. Uh, well, yeah. So you know, Dina Asher Smith. Full on four years training for. You you know Dina Asher Smith, the, uh, yes. the yeah. Well, I mean, she became world champion at the same time as studying for a degree in at London University. So it, it's it's quite because uh, um, uh, Dina and I belong to the same club. Oh right, and does she get advice from you? Exactly from Bromley. Has she ever <laughs> asked you for advice? You know, seeing as you, has she ever asked you for advice? Seeing no. as no, and I, I talk to her coach a lot, <laughs> John Blackie. Uh, he's a great chap. So uh, uh, and things have changed dramatically. But for for D for Dina, there's there's is this second bow to her string, uh, string to her bow, uh, and I think um, if you have just athletics, then things can go horribly wrong, and you've got nothing else. I, I think footballers have exactly the same problem, yeah. and uh, so, you know. So when they finish, they, you know, if a footballer gets injured, and he hasn't got anything else, that's the end of his career. So go, um, I'm just curious if we can go back in time because yeah. you know we are talking decades here. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> you did do the Olympics, and you know, I how was how popular was race walking back then? Because nowadays, I'll be honest with you, when I met your daughter Sarah at Salsi Forest last year, yeah. and I, you know, was marshalling at the marathon she was doing, the she was the only race walker there. Yeah. Um, it's very rare to see race walkers, you know, oh, yeah. go in there and say, I'm a race walker. I'm not, Je you know, it's not Jeff in, I'm literally race walking this race. Very rare that you come across these and it's not really a popu popular activity, you know, in, I'm not sure in schools nowadays, I could be wrong. But it's not really like a TV event. It's only when it comes to the Olympics that you're yeah. like, oh yeah, that does exist. <laughs> yeah. What was it like back then when you were right. race walking? Well, well, I'm, I'm, I've got some photographs from 1908 uh, from, the, from the London to Brighton. And uh, it, it took, I mean, the crowds were, were huge and they had to have police horses and policemen to hold back the crowds. Uh, it, that was in Brighton, and, and the that same was for race walkers, not runners. Race walkers. No, no, that's race walker. Um, and that sort of carried on really right up until uh, about the mid seventies. So um, we, we uh, and there were lots of races which were point to point. So there was Chippenham to Calm, for example, and you'd have huge crowds in the high street just cheering you on as you went. Um, and on the London to Brighton, you'd have, as you were going along, you'd you'd get a, a group of cyclists cheering you on all the way. And uh, as you pass pubs and so on, people would cheer and, and, and so on. Um, the, Le the Leicester Mercury uh, was the same. So, uh, I mean, the crowds were enormous. But of course, what, what happened over the years was that the traffic got more and more... Um, faster and faster and as a result um the um the races declined so i mean on my last uh, last london to brighton um chelsea were playing brighton in brighton and we had cars passing us at 60 70 mile an hour all the way every, every 10 20 seconds so it, it got quite dangerous eventually and uh, that put the end it really put a stop to the road racing which meant that you were then taken into parks and of course you get far fewer people. But uh, up until the seventies, it was, it was quite a well-known sport. So that could be a good excuse for climate change <laughs> and get race walking back out there. <laughs> quite. Let's be honest. And what surprised me, my, my good friend, Leo, who I've had on a previous episode in the early days yeah. of Running Tales, he lives in Seville and he's an international race walker and he's currently right. training. Sorry, training Leo. Leo. What's his name? De Awa. I'll send you. Um, oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. He's, um, he's training for Tokyo at the moment, oh, right. Olympics. And it wasn't really until I met him that I really 
knew about race walking and I, I went to Portugal um, to watch him at one of his races with my husband. Oh, yeah. Yes. And he was saying like, you know, Portugal is very, you know, they're very popular on race walking as well as yeah. Spain, but not really anywhere else. Well, know. Spain, Spain's very, um, it's very popular. Italy, um, yeah. um, Germany, oh, Russia, China. Uh, Oh gosh, and, and mo well, most countries. I think there are more countries have race walkers than play football. But why do you think in England or United Kingdom we've declined our interest in the sport? Is it purely because of the traffic on the roads? There's just no. Um, I think it's it's a, a general decline in sport in general. Um, it's I mean, if you look, it's interesting you saying that. But if you notice with runners in the mm. last even five years how you've got like what i call us fun runners are on the increase you know through the charity oh, yeah. thing. Yes. you know just look at the london marathon now it's just gone mad high on numbers you know for marathons the you know attendees why do you think that race walking is not on the same level to get that attention and draw people in because not everyone is a runner not every, you know there are many walkers out there you only have to look at park runs and you know just generally people during these lockdowns that are enjoying walking i think there's a there's a difference between um doing park runs because I, I, I do lots of park runs well I did until the lockdown <laughs> do lots of park runs uh, I'm just coming up to 150 I'm, I'm about 147 at the moment <laughs> and um, there's a there's a huge difference between that and competitive uh, race walking and this, the same also applies to things like marathon runners 10,000 meters 5,000 meters um, I know at Blackheath and Bromley, uh, we used to have about oh, seven or eight people who were certainly sub 220. Yeah. Now I think we've got one and a lot of, uh, there's an, about might be another two or three that are under three hours. And the same thing can go for 10,000 metres. So all those very high, um, long events, they have, they have declined. At the same time, as you say, the, the park runs and the joggers, they are increasing at a tremendous rate. So uh, there is a, uh, there's obviously a, a, a cutoff uh, at that point. Um, I think also race walking is its own worst enemy in regard to advertising. Yeah. You know, uh, I was, uh, I was in a, uh, an event or just a, a local event but we happened to have uh, Sandra Brown who at that time was a world record holder for 100 miles uh, and she'd also walked from um, uh, Land's End to John O'Groats and I think she she held the record at one stage um, and there were other people there was Paul Nyhill who was an Olympic silver medalist um, there was myself and uh, several other people who were internationals I mean, we were racing and we got abuse. And I thought, you know, I think mainly because people had absolutely no idea what we'd done because there was nothing to tell them. So I think we're, you know, from that point of view, excuse me, from that point of view, um, we need a much better um, image. And of course, the image of race walking is, uh, is also <laughs> very much against it from that point of view. And, and again, people, I mean, if you go back to the 60s, 70s, um, it was quite normal for people to walk quite long distances yeah. uh, uh, normally. So they would know what you were doing. But these days, because we all uh, jump into cars and the result is that people don't really understand quite what, what the human frame is, is being asked to do. So there's a lack of sympathy. Oh, and the other the other thing is, um, with uh, sport, um, particularly with television, um, people want things to be short and quick. They don't want people to spend hours doing something. So I think for the 
the danger is in the Olympic Games, for example, I think we could well lose, I hope we don't, but we could well lose both the walks, the marathon, 10,000 metres. I think they could all go, as well as quite a number of field events like shot put and discus, because they take so long and they don't make good television. Oh, wow. Okay, that's quite interesting. <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting my... you say that, but from my, I know, you know, from me, I love watching elite runners, you know, mm. long distance runners. So I could sit and watch and I will watch the comrades uh, oh, yeah. by YouTube. And that's, you know, that's the South African 54 plus miles. And <laughs> the winner does it in like under seven hours. But then my favourite bit is on the 12th hour, you know, when it's one leg across the line and the other, you know, the other side. And if you haven't got both feet crossing the line the other side and that bell rings, you don't get your medal, race over. So yes, I can understand that. <laughs> I see what you mean, you know, on time scale restriction with TV. Yeah. Um, hence why the Comrades is not shown in the UK, which is a shame. But... Um, <laughs> Going back to the Olympics, we have to talk about it. You, yeah. you, you fly over, I'll, I'll take it, you know, aeroplanes were invented then, only joking. Um, yes, <laughs> they send you on yes, a sir. boat, you know, across the ocean to <laughs> Mexico. It was a Boeing 707. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not Concorde, <laughs> was that still oh, too yeah. early? No, and um, you arrive, you're in Mexico. What was the reception, yeah. what was the reception like? You know, um, well, of course, there's a time difference. So we left London at one o'clock lunchtime uh, and we arrived at Mexico at 10 o'clock at night on, on the clock. Um, we had a, a pretty rough ride on the plane. <laughs> it was, went through a thunderstorm. So, uh, um, and uh, then you, you, you get out and we, uh, we had a Tijuana brass band <laughs> to... to uh, 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 to, 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 to welcome us and uh, I think the officials were met by government officials and so on and then you, you get onto coaches and off to the village and, uh, and that's it really. But did you feel like royalty, did you feel like, like a celebrity or at that point it was like where's my bed, I've had enough? <laughs> um, oh I, I, I quite enjoyed that, <laughs> it, was, it was quite nice. Um, the village was, <laughs> I mean, you think of um, athletes being put up in marvellous accommodation, but we were very cramped. I mean, there were, let's see, we had a, a room, I suppose, um, it, it, it had about seven or eight beds in it. And there were the, uh, let's see, there were three race walkers, a um, couple steeples, Morris Herriot, the steeplechaser, and, uh, Jim Hogan, and unfortunately, you know, Jim Hogan was a marathon runner, Irish, but turned um, English. And, and uh, he was the last up the stairs, <laughs> and there wasn't a bed for him. And uh, so, so the uh, uh, team manager said, oh, we'll put you in the shower for tonight. <laughs> so they put a bed in the shower. Uh, for a joke, somebody pulled the chain no water came out, but the ceiling fell down. <laughs> oh no, so it was a nightmare. <laughs> oh dear, so it was, uh, anyway, they managed to get Jim sorted out eventually. <laughs> and then, so uh, how long was you there before you actually started your first race? Uh, six weeks. You because said six because weeks? Oh wow. Six weeks. Uh, which meant that uh, my school, of course, had to give me six weeks off, which I think was uh, quite a problem for them. Uh, and in fact, one uh, person, I, forgot, I can't remember who it was, lost his job as a result. Wow. So uh, I can't remember who it was now. And uh, so you're all, you're all sort of crammed into this, <laughs> into this room. Uh, and of course, in those days, we didn't have anything about holding camps or being away from the uh, uh, other people. So you met all your competitors all the time. So, I mean, everybody who competed, it was much smaller, of course, in 68 than it is now. Uh, we were all crammed in the village together. And uh, for me, I, I found that a bit overpowering, you know. As, um, and the other the other problem was the the um, uh, the height, because uh, 
you know, I, I can remember walking up the stairs to, to the flat that we were in, breathing heavily, you know, and I was thinking, I've got to race 50 kilometers and I can't even get up the stairs. <laughs> so, you know, that was a bit concerning. <laughs> So did, uh, did, did you sort out the breathing over the six weeks before you had your first It, race? it got better, but uh, you never actually acclimatised. I mean, the, the, the um, result, the research now shows that if you're born at sea level and you compete at altitude, you will never actually acclimatise completely. But what it does do, if you stay at altitude, then when you come back to sea level, there's a huge improvement. Uh, I, I certainly found that. I mean, you can't believe how much air there is down here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 when I came back, I had several personal bests you know, in, in seven mile, ten mile races. You know, just because I've been at altitude. That's an interesting fact to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they've done a. There's been an awful lot of research into all this, and uh, then there's the question: is how long do you spend at altitude before you come down? So. Do you spend, shall we say, a month at altitude? Although Paul Radcliffe has spent, uh, I think, most of the year at altitude at Font Romeau in France. Uh, do you spend uh, a month, then you come down, and do you race immediately, or do you wait for a couple of days? And uh, uh, I think well, certainly at Munich, uh, the next Olympic Games, the the um, uh, the scientists didn't know, and there are all sorts of peculiarities but I think they've got it sorted out now. It sounds like cheating. <laughs> well it's not drugs but true, you know, true, I mean, why, true. Why, why are the Ethiopians and the Kenyans so good at, at marathons and 10,000 meters? Well, they, they live, well I think there are two reasons. One is they live at altitude and it's quite you know, very high uh, and the other is that if you look at where they come from you can go to a, a group of villages and you'll see, well, this chap's got three Olympic golds, this person's got one Olympic gold, you know, they all come from a very small area, and some people think that's because their ancestors were cattle rustlers, and they had to run fast, and that's how they get, you know, because it's in the genes, and I think there's some um, research, very recent research, that suggests that if you uh, train very hard, the genes will actually change, to, to make you into a good runner. So uh, I think I think that's uh, that's my understanding of the very latest. It's um, I don't know, about 90, uh, sorry, 2010, I think. Beyond that. So how do you um, feel about these new Nike trainers <laughs> meant to make a difference? Oh, I think they do. Um, well, I think that there there are going to be uh, changes in, te in technology because uh, in Mexico, for example, um, we just had the very first tartan track. I think, um, uh, you, you know, sort of the, the sponge. Yes. Uh, I mean, up until 67, we we're all training on ash, on ash, um, uh, on cinders. So uh, to run on to, to to run on tartan was a huge improvement. Uh, there were problems with um, javelin throwers because they they'd used to go on ash and then they'd slip, but on tartan they'd stop. And there were quite a number of people that pulled ligaments because they were stopping so quickly. But I mean, the, the, then they trained and changed the technique, and as a result, so you're you're going to get um, improvements in technology, and I think these shoes are just along the, that line. Now, if it's open to everybody, that's fine. Um, what I do disagree with is using uh, performance enhancing drugs. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an absolute no-no. Um, but uh, I've certainly raced against people who were on drugs, I know that. Well, even back then in the 50s and 60s? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Because um, I met one of the East Germans um, or, or um, a, well, a friend of mine met one of the East Germans, and they they said yes, they their drug was put in their food. So that's how they that's how they were given it, um, 
and before a race, two of there'll be three in the team. Two would have um, good races, and one wouldn't. And that was the one that wasn't on the drugs for the purpose of testing. So they did. They were very hot on testing back in. Well, I wouldn't say it was hot. Well, <laughs> not like did. now, but it's oh, not no, 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 now. no, no, now it's, uh, uh, it's no. This is this is right at the beginning of testing. So um, it's your generation that started it all. <laughs> well, we, if we you know, I'm super excited to find out like your feelings when you was running you did 50 kilometers you know kilometers, on the yeah. race how many races did you do during the Olympics was it just one or two you know how many times we, did you go around right well the, the problem was if you if you did a race and you had a bad race that would reduce your confidence so um i mean some people did did a race we, we went out and did sort of fast training sessions um uh, which was sort of race like um and we, we did oh gosh about two a week i think uh, around the um, the mexican motor circuit motor motor race track um but we didn't actually have a genuine race um, looking back, what I think we should have done is, of course, it's very expensive, money was limited and time was limited, but to have gone out to Mexico um, a year, six months prior to the, the, the Games and had a race at that altitude so you would know exactly what you're letting yourself in for. True. Because, it, I mean, to all of us, it was, it was an unknown quantity. I, I know... Um, uh, now it, it depends what event you're doing. If you're up at seven thousand uh, feet, um, if you're a long jumper like long Bob Beeman, you know he broke the world record by what was it, um, a meter almost. Um, and of course, long jump less less gravity, so you go further. And the same with the the shot put. But if you've got the javelin, the javelin throwers uh, bounce the javelin on the air, less air, so it's not so good. Now, for 100 metres, 200 metres, 400 metres, um, the famous one was called Dave Henry's gold medal, um, it doesn't make any difference. In fact, there's less air, so you go faster. But the difficulty comes with 5,000, 10,000 metres. Um, and I think Ron Clark got a heart condition, and I think it was because he ran the 10,000 10, metres in Mexico. I think that's the, that was the cause of it. Um, and but the the interesting thing was that once you got into the marathon and the walks, the reduction in performance was not as great as it was for ten thousand meters percentage wise. So it didn't seem to in the event it didn't seem to have as much uh, uh, influence. But even so, it, it was pretty difficult. Um, so overall, so, so you're saying like you did like a race every so often. Yeah. There wasn't like there is now. They do one big final one, you know. So it's like those that came top, like top yeah. three, for example, in previous races to the build up, your semis and all that. Yeah. You didn't have one final race where those that were very good would have a race against each other and go into the stadium and cross that line and that's how the first second and third is picked how was it done back then oh for the 50k for the 20k 50k marathon you had a national championship the first three in the national championship would go to the olympic games this is oh no no i'm talking during the olympics oh during the olympics yeah um no you didn't go to you couldn't get in the stadium so um, it was all ran outside. So you, you didn't finish a race in the stadium. No, no. So you go all <laughs> that way in the Olympics and you don't race in the stadium. Oh, I see. Well, in the actual event, you do. Yes, yeah, that's well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the actual event. <laughs> I take it as no, one just... event, the final. You're in it. Oh, yes. You you came 18th in the end. Yeah, of... that's right. Yes. Explain that. Talk us through that event, you know. Well, what happened? All right. Um, well, uh, as I say, there were press event, press uh, releases which said we would die. There's no question about that. Uh, there was also a, um, 
students riot and they were threatening to shoot us. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then you've got the altitude. So we knew that Paul Nyhill had a chance of a medal because he'd got the silver medal in Tokyo, the previous games. So he would go out at the front and we were, um, uh, Alf Cotton was the um, coach, or the chef to keep or whatever. Uh, and then Brian Ely and myself would start off relatively slowly and come through. That, that was that was the, the overall team thing. Um, you, we were bussed down to the, um, down to the start and then if we were put in this white room with Mexican music playing and so on it was about an hour before the start and then uh, now in Mexico in the afternoon there were thunderstorms which we thought would be fine uh, you know every afternoon except that one <laughs> and it was a hundred degrees Fahrenheit when we started at two o'clock in the afternoon and uh, we were sitting in this holding pen uh, for about 20 minutes um, and then we were led down onto the track and uh, you, you line up in roughly uh, where the officials think you will finish in the race. So I was in the, I was in the third sort of uh, group and uh, the gun went and off we went and uh, Brian and I decided we would take it relatively gently because we didn't know what was going to happen. And, uh, and Paul went off uh, uh, right at the front. Um, and we, you go out of, out of the stadium onto a, 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 double, a dual carriageway called the Avenida Insurgentes. And uh, we were, I think there was one person from El Salvador behind us. <laughs> we were virtually last. And we gradually worked our way through the field. The first thing that seemed very odd was that at about 10 kilometers, we, per, we passed Bernard Leuchke from East Germany sitting on the side of the road and he'd collapsed. Uh, and you, you don't have an East German collapse in 10 plus kilometers. Um, and then we got to uh, a, a right turn. We're going out to the um, uh, fencing stadium you, you could see it's a dome shape you could see it right in the distance and it was about a sort of 10 miles away and at that point um uh, oh i was with uh, frank clark from australia um uh, brian ely and gertz klopfer from the united states and we uh, we caught up jose pedraza who had just won the silver medal for mexico in the 20 kilometers and that was Mexico's first ever uh, Olympic medal. Really? So there, were, <laughs> so there were a whole group of people. I would suggest, I would think about forty or fifty running uh, in behind the crowd, going Pedraza, or Pedraza. <laughs> you know, that went on for about five miles, <laughs> and uh, and then I I hit rather a bad patch. I mean, you've got to realise that you know the temperature was still sort of pretty high. Uh, Brian went on uh, and I'd got to a place called uh, the Viaducta Tlalpan and uh, we had soldiers every 10 metres both sides of the road in case you know because there might be riots and in my case it was doctors <laughs> and the doctor came up and said to me uh, do you want to retire so I said and I could see Janidi Agapov who held the world record getting it from Russia getting into an ambulance. So I thought, well, if I can get up the slope and pass him, at least I can say I passed the world record holder. And I got up um, uh, and we came back onto the Avenida Insurgentes and it was about, it was about hmm, five kilometers to the stadium. And at that point I was firmly convinced I was last. And, uh, uh, I got, I came, you come up a slope and you can see the stadium light in front of you. And uh, I was walking towards it, but there, between the Avenida and Segentes with their lights and the stadium, there was nothing. And somebody took a photograph of me with a flashbulb, uh, which totally disoriented me and I walked into a tree. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I managed to get down on the track and I looked round and there's Bob Gardner from Australia behind me. 
so I thought, well, <laughs> a big sprint towards the end, and then, uh, and, uh, so I, I finished and uh, uh, was quite unwell <laughs> at that point. But you did it. You, you went to. Went to... Yeah, and the the interesting thing was, uh, they carried they carried us off in an ambulance. And as we were going out, somebody said, oh, there's Shaul Ladani who, from Israel, and he was just finishing as we were being carried off. Uh, and uh, there were about sort of 10, 15 people behind me. So, so do you, at the time, was you given a Great Britain top? And do you still have oh, yes. the top? Do you still I've still got it. Yes, and, and uh, oh, you get um, a suit. I've still got the suit. Can't get into it because I'm a bit, bit broader now. <laughs> In fact, I, I put on a lot of weight between the Olympic Games and the Commonwealth Games because I was in, in Edinburgh and my two suits are entirely different. It must have been the weight training uh, that, that I've been doing in, in between. So, so you, you did the Olympics. What was, yeah. what was there for you, Sean, afterwards? Because how can you be being part of the Olympics? What... Um, what happened after that with you? Oh, I, I was, <laughs> I was very, very disappointed with my Olympic performance. I mean, I, I finished with um, four hours fifty, and my best that year had been four hours twenty. But so, you had the Olympics, Sean. Not many people <laughs> had even well, like left their town or city back then. You've left the country and represented it. Yes, well, mum, mum was a bit uh, isolated. I mean, my mum thought that the Isle of Wight was foreign, <laughs> and in fact, <laughs> the first place I visited overseas was East Germany. <laughs> so, I think she was a bit worried. Uh, and of course, you can't phone. That was the other thing. I mean, I wanted to phone mum and dad, and uh, if they gave me um, uh, a, a time slot. And you, and what they had to do was to connect each country. So you, uh, on the phone, you could hear them talking in different languages, getting through, um, <laughs> getting through to England. And they, eventually they phoned mum and dad. And uh, I, I said, you may have seen me carried, carried off. And then we were cut off. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you, you came, like I said, you came home. You had the, you know, did you get a reception when you come back? Did you get another letter from Prince Philip and the Queen saying, well done, or...? Oh, no. oh, oh, you get you get um, you get invited to the Buckingham Palace for a, um, a, a garden party, and uh, and of course Prince Philip was at the Mexican in the village, so we we had uh, lunch with him at one stage. Well, well, me me and two hundred others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, uh, did you carry on race walking? Oh yes, yes. I'm, unfortunately, um, I was invited to the palace, but I caught mumps and I couldn't go. <laughs> that was a bit of a disappointment. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> but uh, I, um, what I did, I mean, um, I decided that um, while I was at the top, then I would keep going, and uh, uh, and uh, I carried on. So my next. Um, event was the World Championship and the Commonwealth Games and uh, and then after that another World Champion, well the, the, the um, Munich Olympics, uh, I, I didn't qualify because it was a baking hot day and I don't like the heat but uh, I should have gone to, I should have gone to um, Munich. Was that one uh, of your biggest regrets in life not going? Oh I was very disappointed, I'm oh, heartbroken. <laughs> Yes, yes, it was. Uh, as, uh, yeah, I, I would have done quite well there, I think. Uh, well, because I, I, the next year I did the World Championship and f I think I finished 16th in the world because standards had gone up quite considerably by then. So, um, yes, yeah, so that was a, um, a, a real disappointment, but it's all because of the, of the weather. <laughs> That's what I put it down to. And, uh, and then, and then I, I had to decide do I um, uh, do I carry on, or do I give up? And uh, well, the teaching got quite um, onerous at one stage. So um, I thought, well, I'll still keep going because I've got a lot of friends 
And uh, as you may know, teachers are very inward looking. <laughs> uh, and I thought, well, athletics gives me the opportunity to, um, uh, to do something else and, and to mix with people, uh, a rather unusual group of people you'd never otherwise met. And then I, I decided to take up coaching. So as my, um, I, I, as I declined um, physically, then I, I, I took, a, I did a bit of coaching, which was, which was quite good. And I still do. Oh, I'm pleased Even, to hear that. I was going to ask you if you, did it lead into something more? Yes. Actually yes. taking part in the sport. This is brilliant. And you still yes. coach now or you retired? Oh, yes. yes. I've, got, I've got a small group of, of, of about three or four people I coach. Do you um, have a name, your little group? Give them a shout out. <laughs> we don't we don't have a name as a group no, they're, they're members of Blackheath and Bromley and so uh, and we train at Norman Park normally I mean I haven't seen them for ages because of Covid um, but yes uh, and uh, they, they have done some of them done pretty well in the past so um, one of them as a junior as a, a very youngster had an international against Ireland and won <laughs> so uh, you know they, they, they do they do quite well. So but, anyone uh, that was listening to this, just to round this off, Sean, yeah. and was thinking, I wouldn't mind giving this race walking a try. What, yes. what, what advice would you give? Um, see if you can find a club or a coach, uh, someone that uh, will, will help you. Um, and look look for events. And um, in this country, I think you're looking at events in in London, uh, the Midlands, Leicester, Birmingham, uh, Leeds. Leeds is the centre of British race walking at the moment. So, uh, and um, Wales. So, um, try and find someone that you that knows what they're talking about, really. Um, now you can do that by going to um, the uh, UK Athletics website, and that will tell you, give you um, coaches that uh, you can, uh, they can contact, um, or join an you know, uh, join, join a club is the <laughs> is the answer, and that's that's really important. Um, what so, we have to ask the listeners will ask if you don't mind asking, how old are you now? Um, I'm seventy seven. Wow, and you're, you're coaching still, and you're still part of the sport, and how's your health? Um, well, I'm, su I'm suffering from a sciatica, I had a bad sciatica attack um, back in January, but otherwise, I mean, I did four miles this morning, <laughs> otherwise uh, quite good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm race walking in park runs and doing about 35 minutes. Oh, you're, a, you're an inspiration, Sean, you really are. <laughs> really are amazing so no thank you for sharing your walking tale even though it's called running tale but we just have to call this episode the running uh, the walking tales and uh yes yeah, you know thank you for sharing with us today okay right thank you very much for asking me